Bless your heart. Everyone feeling good in the house of God tonight? All right. How are we feeling online? If you're online, give me a shout right now. All right, let us know in the chat there. Listen, um, I, uh, as I was preparing for this message this week, if you've been with us uh, throughout the year, we started the year in the book of Joshua. And, uh, you know, to be honest, we, we don't really do sermon series uh, in this church. Uh, and not that I have any problem with sermon series. Uh, it just, it's just not kind of the way that we roll. Uh, but earlier in the year, uh, God spoke to us from the book of Joshua, and I preached a couple of messages from Joshua, and then we kind of circled back mid-year. And as I was preparing this week, I felt the Holy Spirit stir me about uh, as we're coming near the close of this year to touch base back, circle back around in Joshua, get to a part of the book that we haven't got to yet. And so I want to read to you tonight, before we get into this message, I want to read to you from Joshua chapter 6. You can remain standing uh, as we read the Word of God. But starting uh, at verse 1, it says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. Do we, do we have any trumpet players? And that, we, got, we got a trumpet player. <laughs> Your name is Joshua? Man, oh man. You're lucky I didn't know this beforehand, Joshua. Because I would have said, brother, blow that horn. But there's a lot of marching and a lot of trumpets. If you're a trump, being a trumpet player is no joke, right? It's no joke. See, he knows, he knows, it's no joke. There were trumpets blowing this whole time. These trumpet players were ready. They didn't show up unprepared. They were ready for the task at hand. They are ready. But Joshua had spoken to the people. We read that. Uh, where are we up to? Verse nine, the armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. And then... You know that emoji where like the face just kind of melts? Let's, let's, let's try that again. Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. Now we shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted 
to the Lord. I believe this year has been a year of taking ground. It's been a year where cities in the spiritual realm have been possessed. I believe battles have been won, but I believe there's still much to do. I believe it's time to prepare for the promise. Can we take a moment and just pray as we come around this word tonight? I believe God wants to speak to you and prepare you for the promise that he has. Father, we thank you, God, that your word still speaks. Your word is still powerful. And so, Lord, tonight as we come around your word, I ask you, God, would you come and bring the revelation into each and every one of our hearts in the way that we need it so that we can be fruitful for the sake of the kingdom. We love you. We adore you. Just like Joshua's men, everybody shouted a big amen tonight. Come on. Awesome. Come on, grab your seats tonight in the room. We are so glad to have you here. Just turn to your neighbor and say, It's time to prepare for the promise. We've been talking about taking ground. We've been talking about taking ground. And uh, to be honest, these last few weeks as I've just been praying and thinking back over the year, in my prayer time, there's been a few moments where I've come to the Lord in somewhat of a perplexed state because some things that I had thought, some things that I had anticipated would happen this year have not transpired. Maybe I'm alone, maybe this is resonating for some of us here in this place tonight. And as I've been praying, I've been saying to God, God, I thought we were taking ground. And God said, you are. But I'm like, but God, in my mind, this is, This is what I saw as building this year. And God said, I didn't tell you to build yet. See, let me unpack this for you. It's a different process taking ground than it is building a house. I hope this liberates you and gives you some excitement in your spirit tonight that this has been a year of taking territory. You know, when you take land, when you take territory, you take essentially potential is what you're doing. A a few years ago, back in 2015, BC, before COVID, uh, back in 2015, my wife and I had moved here uh, in 2012, and we had been trying to buy a house. We had sold our house in Melbourne, Australia, and thankfully the, the, the property market was in a great way in Melbourne when we sold our house. And so we came here and we were trying to buy a house here and we had a hard time It wasn't that we didn't have the money in the bank, we just didn't have this thing called a credit score, which we didn't know about. And so we went to the bank and said, how do we get a loan so we can buy this house? And they said, well, you need a credit score. I said, how do we get a credit score? They said, get in debt. I said, well, I don't wanna get in debt. We have money in the bank. And they said, no, but this is how you get a high score is by getting in high debt. And we'll, we'll preach that message another day. But I move on. This one particular Saturday morning, we were looking through real tracks as we often did and my wife stumbled across this piece of property. And to be honest, it looked too good to be true. It was, so, it was almost so good to be true that we almost didn't go and see it. But there was something in our hearts of go and look at this land. And so we drove out and it's a little ways out of the city, but we drove out and we looked at this land and we put in an offer and we, we secured this land. We purchased this land so that we could build. Now, again, this is BC, right? This is before half of California moved here and uh, kind of took our prices through the roof. Bless you if you're here from California. If you believe in God for a house still, that's okay. I believe God can still do miracles. He, he can multiply. Amen. But you know, we... We showed up to this land once we were the proud owners of this land. I showed up there one day and, and uh, you know, we have a few acres and I, I, at first I couldn't really differentiate between what were trees and what were weeds because there were some, some pretty monstrous weeds on this property. And so, you know, we, we start planning and thinking about what it is that we want to build on this property, but I'm, kind, I'm a visual, I, I got to see it, you know, like I got to see it. I got to see it. And I couldn't see nothing but weeds. And so 
I thought to myself, well, I really should get this land cleared so that there's a blank canvas and we can really see what the potential is. But I was a little too cheap to pay somebody to come and do the job because I thought, you know what? I can go to Home Depot I can do this myself. So I go to Home Depot and I'm walking down the aisle of the weed whackers. I don't want one of these like old school weed whackers that like is gonna make my car smell of gasoline. I don't want that. So I shell out the money for a battery operated weed whacker. Because they told me. Oh yes, it's gonna last just as long. One charge, it's like one full tank of gas. Can I tell you friends, they were lying. I charged up that weed whacker. I drove out to the property and man, I fired that thing up. I put on my earmuffs. I had my goggles because safety first, right? And I also don't know what I'm doing. So I go out there with this weed whacker and I, to be honest, I probably just should have bought a chainsaw because these weeds were so big. But I start hacking into these weeds with a weed whacker. You know how long that thing lasted? About 20 minutes. I took down about six weeds. I had to get in my car, drive back to my house, put that thing on charge, sit around, make myself a coffee, wait for an hour, drive back out there and, and try again, 20 minutes late, do the same Friend, I spent a majority of my day driving back and forth between my house because I was too cheap to even go and buy another battery. See, sometimes we want to take ground, but we don't want to pay the price. Over the next year or so, we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do with this land and every now and then I'd get this inspired moment where, you know what, I, I'm a landowner, I've taken territory, I better go and make sure that I remind that territory that I am the owner. So I charge up my weed whacker and my one battery and I drive out there and 20, A little, a little further on in the journey, we signed a contract to build a, a, a house. And one day I was out there and I thought to myself, you know, I, I probably should show the builder that I care about this land. I wanna help them see what I see in my heart. So I go out there this one day with my weed whacker and I'm out there with my earmuffs on and my, and I turn around and somebody's there and it scared the life out of me and it's my builder. And he kind, of, he kind of looked at me with this kind of this perplexed smile on his face. He said, hey man, um, what you doing? I said, I mean like, you can't tell like what I'm doing. I'm preparing for the promise. <laughs> Just kidding, it was already flat by then, but. And you know what, he looked at me and said, you don't need to do that, cause we're gonna take care of it. And I had a revelation in that moment that I was attempting to do something that was impossible in the natural because I did not have the right tools or the right ability to do it. But there was someone who did have the tools and the ability. You know what it was? It was the builder because the builder had the plans. The builder already knew what could be built on there. He didn't need to see with his eyes because he had a plan. Roll with me now. Some of you, you've been discouraged and disappointed by the end of this year because you had a plan. You thought you had a way of building something and God said, you're not gonna be able to do it with the tools in your hand, but if you'll trust me, I am the one who is gonna build on your behalf. God's got a plan. 
We've got to allow him to use us to build. How often do we, we get a, an idea, a dream? See, I, I want to share this with you because I believe it's time. This is the time to prepare for the promise. Yeah. Part of the problem for us so many times is we wait till we get into the promise before we start to prepare for it. It's kind of like New Year's resolutions, right? The amount of times that we, we get to the new year. And it's like, man, like, cookie free in 2023. <laughs> That's, we wake up, New Year's morning. Somebody tweet that or something. <laughs> and we have this epiphany, cookie free in 2023. Fast forward to about four o'clock in the afternoon and you find yourself in the pantry. What are, what are we, what are we gonna do for dinner tonight? As you're stuffing your face full of cookies. Can I tell you why you failed? Because you didn't prepare your pantry for the promise. Some of us have got to start now preparing the spiritual pantry of our lives. We wonder why we get into the next season and we can't sustain or we can't fulfill or we can't walk out what it is that God has called us to because we weren't prepared before we got there. This is part of the promise of taking territory. You have to prepare the ground before you can build. You have to prepare the land before you can establish anything on it. We've got to prepare our lives before we step in to the season. See, we get, we get stuck and we're there like on the cookies. I was thinking about this actually the other day. Like we, we never really had it. You know, some families will tell you about their stories with their kids and cookie jars. We never really had that because our cookies never made it to a jar. They're just gone before they even get there, right? But you, have, you ever seen a kid who's got their hands stuck in a cookie jar and man, they're distressed because they got their hand in, but they cannot for the life of them get that hand out of that cookie jar. Mom, mom, mom. And they come out with the cookie jar and the cookie jar is stuck around their fist and sure enough, somehow their hand went in, but they cannot figure out how to get their hand out. You know why? Because they didn't get the revelation of cookie free in 2023, right? They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to take cookies out. And even though they're stuck, they can't let go of the cookie. Maybe because they think to themselves, if I let go of the cookie, then I'll never get another cookie. If I let go of the past, I'll never get another opportunity. If I let go of this pain, I'll never, I'll never be able to experience something in the future that I am gonna love. I, if, I, if, I, if I don't let go of this now, then maybe I can hang on to it forever. Can I tell you this, friend? Some of you, you're stuck in the jar. You're stuck in the past because you haven't learned that if you wanna step into the future, you have to let go of the past. Turn to your neighbour right now and say, let it go. Oh, wow. I thought I was in Nashville. <laughs> let it go, let it go. We, we gotta learn how to let it go so that we can step in to what's next. You don't have to start this new year like you started this year. You don't have to step into the next season like you did into this season. The choice is yours. Are you going to let it go and allow God to do what He needs to do? See, some of us, God's been speaking to us all year about letting go of some things. He's been speaking to some of us about dealing with some issues in our lives, moving on from some things, and we've wrestled with it, we've argued, we've reasoned, but you're still stuck now, I'm not here to condemn you, friends. I believe this, this is an encouragement to you because this is the moment that you can tonight. Say, so you know what? Once and for all, I'm going to let it go so I can step in to what's next. Give me an amen. If you believe it is true tonight, 
in this place. I believe there's a new vision for a new year. There's a new vision for a new year. I wanna, I wanna ask you tonight, what, what, what do you see? What do you see? When you, when you think about your life, like what, what do you see? When, you, when you're dreaming, when you're talking, when, you, when you, you're lying in bed at night, what is it that you see? There's this moment here at the start of Joshua chapter six. And God says to Joshua, in verse two, he says, see, for I have given you the city. I don't know if you realize this, but when God said that to Joshua, Joshua and the Israelites were not in control or possession of the city. In fact, the Bible goes on to tell us that it was on lockdown, it's like the original lockdown, right? It was, it was on lockdown, nobody could go out, nobody could come in, it was a fortified city. And yet God says to Joshua, see, for I've given you the city. Did God get it wrong? Was, did God misspe misspeak? D did God have a wrong read on it? No, I think, friends, what God was saying to Joshua was, hey, I know you can see some things with your eyes, but I wanna lift you up and I wanna elevate your vision to see what I'm seeing. Because what you see right now is a city that's, that's on lockdown, but what I see is a city that's already possessed, that's already been given over for my glory. See, what you see is something that's shut down, something that's broken, something that you can't move on from. But God already sees your future, friend, and He's inviting you in this moment to step up and out of the natural to begin to see with a supernatural viewpoint. See, Joshua had to begin to see in the Spirit. See, we, we, we live in a society that sells us this narrative. You just gotta follow your dreams. Just follow your dreams. You know, I actually know a lot of people that have followed their dreams. And got to the end of their life and realized that they were still unfulfilled even though their dreams had been fulfilled. Now, I'm not saying it's not right to dream. We should. But I, I, I believe this is how the Bible gives us the context to dream. I believe that when you get a vision from God, more importantly, if you get a vision of God, then you can begin to dream from that vision. That's how God does things. Joshua 5, we, we read, starting at verse 13, it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. See, Joshua needs a strategy. But he doesn't find himself on the Googles. He doesn't find himself on the interwebs. He's not out trying to research. He's not going through history trying to figure out how they could like shout at the right frequency and if they all maybe get the frequency at the same time and the exact same frequency that somehow there'll be some, you know, some frequency wave that goes out and just shakes the walls till they come. That's not what happened. We find Joshua not with his friends, not with his peers, we find him outside the city on his face before God, inquiring of the Lord. But before he moves on from inquiring of the Lord, what does he do? He worships. He, he gets a revelation, but then he worships. He falls face down before the Lord because he realizes it's a holy moment. See, I wonder how many times God speaks to us and we get the revelation. We're out the door. We're out the door. Yeah. God's like, hey, wait, wait up a minute. It's not about getting the thing done. It's about you being reminded that I'm holy. Yeah. 
that I'm good, that I'm powerful, and no matter what the outcome is, I'm still God. So before you get too busy doing the thing that you're hoping to see, would you just take a moment and get on your face before me and begin to worship? Would you just take a moment and begin to lift up some praise? See, as I read the Bible, I realize this. There's never a wrong time to praise. There's never a wrong time to worship. There's never a time where we shouldn't just stop and go, you know what? Let's just take 10 seconds. Let's take 20 seconds. Let's take 30 seconds and worship Him because when you see Him face to face, when you get a revelation, that is the response. The response is, oh, come on. Somebody just take a moment and give Him some praise. Somebody just take a moment and tell Him, Jesus, I love You. I worship You. I'm thankful for You. See, when you get a vision, it changes everything. If you're here in the room, there's, there's some lights out around the room that the team have done such an amazing job of setting up so that we can see you while we preach. If you ever came to Rocket Town, man, it was hard to see people back in the old days, BC. But it, it, back in the old days, it was hard to see people. I love that we have light around here. It's, it's beautiful. But up here on the stage, we have a, a few extra lights and they're bright, like real bright. Like actually, sometimes it's hard to see through my glasses because they're so bright, but they're necessary. And they're helpful. And it helps our friends on the stream to be able to see us. And, but here's the thing, Th these lights that are up here, I, I, I can't look at them for but a second without it impacting my vision. Now, I don't suggest you do this because I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't want you to hurt yourself, right? But I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this myself for a second. It's, see, if I just stare at that light, just even just for those couple seconds, you know what happens? Now when I look out in the crowd, all of a sudden, how I see has been altered. Now, there's a lot of beautiful faces in this room, but to be honest, when I look in a person's face, all I see is then glowing. Now Wes glows at the best of times, but, but, but right now, I, I think that it's Wes there. I'm pretty sure it's Wes. But all I can see, you know what I can see? All I can see is a white, glowing circle in the center of my vision. Sometimes we find ourselves getting so bogged down by the things that we see in front of us by the details that we see in front of us, by the annoying things that we might see in front of us, by these things that we might see in front of us, because we've spent more time looking at this than we have at this. But see, if I will lift my eyes and I'll look at the light, all of a sudden my vision is affected. The longer I look at the light, the more my vision is going to be affected. The longer I look at the light, the more time it's going to take before that dissipates. Now here's the reality. If I look at that bright light for a minute, that's, honestly, my eyes are gonna be affected for a while and I probably won't do that because I won't be able to read the rest of my notes and I don't wanna fall off the stage or anything crazy like that. But you know what? If I look at it now, for the next five or six minutes, maybe my vision will be altered, but then all, it, over time, it's gonna go back to how it was and I'll be able to see some of the imperfections in people's faces that I couldn't see before. I, I, I hope you're understanding where I'm going with this because sometimes we get, we get hung up on imperfections because we've lost sight of the bright light that we should be finding ourselves on the regular, coming back to and saying, God, I need to just keep my eyes fixed on You because I'm bogged down in my problems right now. I'm bogged down in the things going on around me right now. I'm bogged down with these issues. I'm bogged down with these people. I'm bogged down with these things that I'm reading about on Twitter and Instagram and social media. And God said, but just fix your eyes on me again and watch what happens. <laughs> See, if I fix my eyes on the light, then my vision is changed. Now, here's, here's what's amazing. If I, if I were to go home tonight, which I will later tonight, I'll go home. And before I go to bed, if, before I switch out all the lights in our house, before I, 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 I set up this home automation in our house and I just hit one button and the entire house turns off. It's awesome when it works. I just got an amen from my wife there. Before 
before I hit that one button, if I were to look in the light, the brightest light that I could find in my room, and then hit that button, as I close my eyes, you know what I would see as I go into my dream state? The last thing that I would see would be that light. What if the last thing that you saw before you lay your head down at night was the face of Jesus? What if the last thing that you saw when you're going off to sleep was His Word? I wonder, see, some of us, we, we have trouble with our dreams, but I wonder what it is that you've been looking at, the vision that you've been having that's causing the trouble in your dreams. I wonder what you've been looking at that you don't even realize is causing you to dream because you've had a vision of something else. Can I tell you, friends, the more you get a vision of God's way of doing things, the more it begins to change the way that you dream because all of a sudden you have context for kingdom dreams. Get a kingdom vision and you'll walk in kingdom dreams. Doesn't mean it won't be challenging at times doesn't mean that there won't be moments where you lose sight, but you gotta come back to that place and say, God, I'm reminded of what you spoke to me about and I wanna fix my eyes on it and get my dreams in line with what you're doing in Jesus' name. See, when we lose sight of a supernatural vision, we get distracted by natural situations. That will preach. Yes and amen, Pastor Henry. You know, for 40 years, the Israelites walked around eating something called manna. It literally means, what is it? That's the literal definition. They didn't know what it was. God just provided it for them because it was a promise. They came out of slavery on the way to the promised land and they were provided for supernaturally every single day. But you know what? After a while, the miracle became a little mundane. Imagine eating the same thing every single day of your life. Although they do say people who are kind of on, on the genius end of the spectrum, that, that's something that they do. And uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that's something that I like to do, to eat the same thing. I'm just gonna claim that over my life in Jesus' name. But was, see, see they, were, they were eating the same thing every day and they lost sight of the miracle. And so they began to murmur they began to grumble. I, I preached a whole message on this earlier in the year. I'd love you to go back and listen to it at some point. It's called Move or Murmur, Taking Ground, Move or Murmur. Because you know what happened? The very fact that they lost sight of the miraculous provision that God had for them because it became mundane and monotonous, they lost sight of it and so they began to grumble. And because they grumbled on the journey to the promised land, they missed out on getting to the promised land. I wonder how many of us here in this place, how many people watching online have become a little familiar with God's provision in our lives or God's blessing in our lives and we've looked at it and gone, well, it's just that again. And God's saying, yeah, but if it wasn't for me, you would have nothing at all. We've become a little familiar. Can I tell you, friends, don't get familiar even in the Monday. Do you know how to get to the promised land? Just be thankful for the little things along the way. We're waiting for the moment, but God said, just start by being thankful with the mundane. Well, that's a word that will preach. Just amen that for somebody else. Amen that for your friend. And I, amen that for somebody that might be watching online right now. See, we want the moment, but God's saying, just be faithful in the mundane. And I'll take you to the place that I promised. But right now, I'm preparing you for the promise. Come on, say it again. Say it. God's preparing me for the promise. It's a big statement. I had to take some time there because we're not all ready for this, but it's a declaration. God's preparing me for the promise. God's preparing me for the promise. See, we've got to get grateful for what He's doing in the moment. See, you realize this? It wasn't until the entire original generation it wasn't until the old generation was fully dead. This, this is gonna be awesome for you. It wasn't until the, the old generation was dead 
that the manna stopped and they began to eat of the fruit of the promised land. Everything of the past had to be dead before they could eat from the future. Some of us, we want to taste God's promise, but we're too busy chewing on the past. We're, man, we're, we're prophesying about it on, on Instagram and my feed looks amazing. And here's, man, here's what God's doing in my life and here's the promise and I'm a highly favoured and, you know, hashtag too blessed to be stressed. I mean, I'm, I'm here. Right? <laughs> and we're talking about tasting of it online. But man, offline. That person, me, 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 me. Oh, man, I can't believe it's been five years and I'm still thinking about how badly they treated me. Me, 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 me. Man, man, I, man, I've been here at the Belonging for a long time, but man, my previous church, my, me, 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 me. Yeah, man. When I was a kid, man, when I was in my first church, when I was in high school, friend, I'm not demeaning the situation or the things that you walk through, but can I tell you this? It's unlikely that you will taste of the goodness of the promised land while you're still chewing on the past. And in fact, some of us, we've got discouraged on this journey because we're not yet tasting of it. And so we've begun to actually dig up the past and we started to chew on some things that we thought were long gone in our lives. You know, like, man, I thought by this point in the year, I'd be dating someone. Maybe I'll just go back to that old fling that I had. Man, I stepped out in faith. I stepped out in faith. Did it get too real for us here on a Tuesday night? My heart got tender, but now I'm going back to Tinder. Don't do it. Woo! Man. I stepped out in faith, God. I took a risk. I started that business, but it's not flourishing. Maybe I'll just go back to that old job. But God, this is what the Israelites did. We were eating fish, but you were in slavery. That I had a boyfriend, but you were in slavery. And I don't mean like, but you were bound to something that you should not have been bound to. Maybe I'll move back to Egypt. Maybe I'll move back to California. Don't do it, friends. This is the promised land. <laughs> Shout out to all our beautiful friends online in California. God needs you there. God needs you there. This is the thing. We're chewing on the stuff from the past and God's saying, deal with it because you're not going to win any battles by looking in the rearview mirror. See, it was Joshua's encounter that led to the strategy for victory. Joshua had to get on his face before God before he could see the walls come down. See, some of us, we want to see the end result. And God's saying, just start with the first step. We want to see the walls come down. But God's saying, I got to see your pride come down before the walls are going to come down. See, we want to lift up the shout, but we got to learn how to first be quiet. This is, this is incredible. God says to Joshua, tell the people this in verse 10. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then, shout. let's try that again. Then, shout. this side, then, shout. this side, then, shout. everybody ready? Then, shout. then shout. We want to make a lot of noise before we've learned how to get still and quiet before the Lord. See, there was no talking while they marched. 
which maybe that was exciting at first. You know, all right, I can't, it's like a game. Yeah, I'm gonna march around you. It's like we, 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 um, we, we play this type of Uno. What do we call it, kids? Spicy Uno. Is it the four? Holly, tell me, is it the four that we have to go quiet? If somebody slaps a four on that table and you make a sound, you gotta pick up some cards, right? That's how we play it. No joke. I wonder if it was like a bit of a game for them. Hey, the first day was, was easy. They go home, everyone's excited. The second day, they go around, oh, all right, yeah. Third day, same thing. Imagine they're marching around, they're like, yep, seen that. Yep, yeah, seen that part too, yeah. Seen that, man, this is, this is okay. The temptation to begin to talk. The fourth day, imagine if they start being like, man, did, Joshua, this is the plan? Like, hey, did, you, did Joshua say that this was the plan? Because this plan it seems kind of dumb, don't you think? No, but really, man, I mean, like, it was good when we started, but it's just, I don't know, man, this, this is boring. It was exciting at first, it was a bit boring. Man, it was fifth day, oh man, really, same, again? Same place, again, wow. Oh, here we are, okay, all right, yep, yeah, yep. Okay, just showed up, yep, there's some more songs, yep. Man, they're up there singing again, you heard this song before, yep. Okay, all right, yep, yep. Thanks, Shani, I've heard you sing it before, yep, great, okay. The sixth day, oh man, okay, really, Andrew? If you walked in. Yeah, well, I did, so I just... And then the seventh day, we got to walk around, what? Seven times? Man, I knew I didn't want to go to that church. I should have read, I should have heeded to those Facebook reviews. The service goes for six hours, seven hours. Walking around this seven times feels like it's going for six hours. We're going to sing that song again? Yes, we're going to sing it again. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Do you remember? Remember when we started back on the first day? You remember those days? Remember? You know, it was simpler back then, and you know, it was just it was last, and it was you know, and, oh man, God was moving back then. Here we are on the seventh day, and we're going around and around and around. God hadn't stopped moving. We just lose sight of where God's moving. See, some of us we we want to show up for the miracle. So we show up on the seventh day, but God's saying, hey, where were you the other six days? <laughs> we gotta get busy marching around it on the six days before we're gonna see it happen on the seventh day. In fact, I wonder what would happen, honestly, if I can just be very candid with you because I love you all. I'm so glad that you're part of this church. But what if we didn't just show up on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night saying, hey, you're gonna lead us around one time when everybody else has been spending the last six days marching around so that there's even some breakthroughs for you to have? What if we all got on board and said, you know what, all week I'm gonna pray and fast about what God might do when we come together? This, this is a word. Because we're in this together. But sometimes we can get busy. And the me, 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 becomes me, 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 And before long, Before long, we can't hear the whisper of God because of the noise of the murmurs. If you want the breakthrough, friend, if you want to step into the promised land as God has for you, we've got to learn how to quiet ourselves. What are you wasting your breath on? What are you wasting your breath on? Because I wonder, if they had murmured and talked for those seven days, when it came time to shout, whether they had 
any shout left. God is preparing something in the spirit. And we got to learn how to get quiet in the moments that we need to get quiet. We need to learn how to get alone with God in the moments where we get alone, when we need to get alone so that when it's ready to shout, when it's time to shout, man, we've got something to shout about. We got something to shout about. So you got, you got to understand this, that the enemy loves to, he loves, he loves to get you busy so that you're not ready. That's a whole other message I'll preach another day. I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. The, the band can come, they can come join me. Otherwise I'm going to preach all night. I was thinking about this because in Joshua chapter 6, they see the walls come down. And then if we kind of go in reverse, at the end, it's not backmasking, it's okay. You don't even know what backmasking is. Go and look it up. It was a thing in the church in the 90s. It was a thing. They don't know, nobody knows what backmasking is. Wow, it's a little side note right here. Man. <laughs> back, back in the olden days, uh, when I was actually in high school, uh, there was this whole thing in the church about, you know, how rock music was evil and it was kind of the season where everyone was burning their vinyls. Um, before vinyl made a resurgence, people were burning their vinyls and their cassettes. Some, some of them needed to be burnt, let's be honest. Some of it needed to go. But there was this whole thing about backmasking. If you played a song backwards, it had like this subliminal message. And they would say like, you know, was it another one bites the dust? It was like, I like to smoke marijuana or something like that. And I'm like, I'm like, most of us couldn't even work out the lyrics when it was playing forwards, let alone backwards, right? I'm just gonna step back into my message. So in Joshua chapter six, Joshua chapter six, we get to see the shout and the walls come down. And then if we back up to the end of Joshua chapter five, we find the strategy and the method of how that happens because Joshua has a face-to-face -face encounter with God. But there's something that happens right before that that we haven't touched on yet tonight. See, every young man, young Israelite man, before they were in the wilderness would have been circumcised. Now, when they were out in the wilderness, every young man who was born on the journey to the promised land had not yet been circumcised. And God says to them before, this is what's so fascinating, before they can take the territory, before they can take down cities, before they can go and have the victories, there has to be a fresh consecration, a fresh cutting away. And so in Joshua chapter 5, these men are circumcised. The very next thing that they have to do, and we don't really have the time frame on this, so I'm just going to take us on a little bit of a journey and just say, hypothetically, not long after this moment, the next thing that they have to do is go and march around the city in silence. <laughs> I don't know if they're worried about saying words or just moaning in pain. Now, I don't want to be crass or inappropriate in this moment, but it's important for us to understand this. See, those men knew that even in their pain, there was a right thing to do with their pain. And this is, this is a word that I hope will encourage some of us here in this place tonight. Because some of us, and I don't wanna make light of your situation tonight, friend, but these men were carrying pain in a, in a private place. Some of us are carrying pain in a private place and we don't know how to process the pain. And so we're out talking about the pain over and over and over, not even realizing that what we're doing is causing ourselves to stay chewing on the past. Now, I'm not here to tell you, friend, that you just forget about that pain, 
that ignore what happened. I'm not saying any of that at all, but I am saying this. They knew what to do with their pain. They knew how to bring it before God and get on the journey with God. Can I encourage you tonight, friends? Some of you, you, you've stayed in your pain. You've stayed in pain in areas that have been private, painful in your life. But you've stayed in it because you haven't taken it to the right place. Can I tell you where the right place is? Bring it to the Father because He can do something about it. You might need to get some help. You might need to get some prayer. You might need to get some counsel. But first, start by bringing your pain to God. Even if it feels like you're marching on the way to the miracle on the journey. Start there and allow God to take that pain and make it right. I believe He wants to heal you. I believe He wants to set you free. If you would stand to your feet across this room tonight. If you're watching online, just take a moment, close your eyes with us wherever you are. I believe this is a uh, significant word for many of us here in the room watching online tonight that God wants to, He wants to deal with some things before we step out of this year into a new year. Will only be a few more minutes. But I believe what God wants to do in these few moments is actually going to set you up to be ready for the promise. To set you up for what God wants to begin to build on that territory in this next year. Just close your eyes wherever you are. See. Joshua's obedience and his courage left an inheritance. Joshua wasn't obedient to his own dream, but he was obedient to God's call. He wasn't courageous about his own dream, he was courageous about God's call. And because he was obedient and courageous to the call of God, there was an inheritance for the next generation. There was an inheritance of victory all throughout the years that he led because he walked in obedience and courage. Some of you have got discouraged. Maybe you lost sight and so you stepped out of obedience. Maybe you lost sight and thought I'm going to go back to some old ways. Can I tell you tonight, friend, don't wait till you get to the promised land before you begin to consecrate these things to God. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment to consecrate yourself before God. This is the moment to consecrate the dreams and the desires of your heart. This is the moment to consecrate those old habits that you've fallen back into. This is the moment to consecrate your mind again that once was walking well with God, but you've got caught up in some stuff again. This is the moment to consecrate yourself and get out of that relationship that you know that you shouldn't be in and get to that place with God again. This is the moment, friend. We're going to take a couple moments and just worship in this place, but I just want to leave this altar open because I believe for some of us tonight, this is a moment to consecrate yourself again before the Lord. It might be the smallest of things. It might be the, the biggest of things. But friend, would you consecrate yourself before God?